and it's their intrinsic nature. Yeah, like, it's cool, basically. Sound, feel, or sound like So first, let me say this. I'm going to just break it down to you and just give it to you straight out flat before I prove my point. The Greeks made up the Old Testament. Plain and simple. This is what history is telling us. The Greeks came up with your Old Testament. They made the whole thing up. They copied it and stole it and basically used Greek mythology and uh, plagiarized it and made it into different stories and added a lot of philosophy into it and a lot of mathematics into it and basically gave the Old Testament to what we are supposed to believe is the Hebrews, but we're not Hebrews. They were the Egyptians that was in Israel. And we're going to go through all that. So what I'm saying basically before I get into the information is the Greeks came up with your Old Testament. I went into this a little bit in the last video. I'm going to go into it a lot more. It was the Greeks. They came up with the Old Testament to control the Egyptians that was in Israel. There was no Hebrews. And I know people are going to say, well, that's crazy. And not after I go through this information, I'm going to show you what has taken place. And we're going to shed a lot of light on this whole deception. So, listen, let me be a lot more clear on what I just said. Because I know a lot of people are like, what the hell? I know a lot of people will stay away from this subject. A lot of people wouldn't touch it. You're not going to find what I'm about to show you in one single book. You have to read a lot of books to put this stuff together. And I think that's by design. But a lot of people wouldn't touch this topic. But I want to make it a lot more clear. There was no such thing as a Hebrew or Jew during the time of Ramses. Period. But I'm going to go one further. There was no such thing as a Hebrew or Jew before the Greeks invaded Egypt. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, man, that's crazy. They found artifacts and we have this. We're going to explain all that. I'm going to explain that whole thing. You got to remember to take your mind out of this Bible because it's not proven. If you're looking at the Bible as history, then you're not looking at real history. You can't take the Bible as history, then compare it to history outside the Bible, and then say it's equal when it's not. All of the pieces are there. They're not hiding this information. It's right in front of you. There was no such thing as a Hebrew during that time. And I'm going to get into the proof, and I'm going to show you that the Greeks came up with this whole mess, and the people who we think are Hebrews are actually Egyptian. Now, what's suspect is... Herodotus never mentions the Hebrews. He doesn't talk about them. In all of the writings of Herodotus, he never mentions the Hebrews. He doesn't talk about the Jews. He doesn't get into that whole Jewish Hebrew situation. And the Hebrews should have been one of the people. If he was going to write about somebody, if he was going to write about a people, the Hebrews should have definitely been a people that he really talked about extensively. Especially when you look at the Old Testament and how much they had supposedly have done in the ancient world. The Hebrews should have been well known. But Herodotus doesn't talk about them. He talks about the ancient Egyptians. He talks about Syria. He talks about the, uh, the Greeks. He talks about so much, but he never mentions the Hebrews. Why is that? Because they did not exist. They didn't exist. Now, you would think if the Hebrews were in Egypt, then the Egyptians would have been talking about them. All the people would have been talking about what happened with parting the sea and, you know, the Jews being enslaved there. It would have been talked about, would have been known about the plagues and the people dying and everything that happened in the Old Testament would have been talked about. It would have been hieroglyphics of it and Herodotus would have knew about it and we have, he would have definitely spoken about it and written about it, but he didn't. So now understand something. Before the Persians invaded ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptians was teaching mathematics and philosophy to the Ionians, to the Italians, and to a few other people who came into ancient Egypt. Now, we know that the ancient Egyptians was engaged in trade with a few people, with the Greeks, with the Ionians. I'm going to get into that later. But there was teaching mathematics and philosophy. Now, we can go to Tallies. We can go back to Tallies, who was a Greek philosopher who was born in Miletus. Now, Miletus is in Ionia. 
Now, when you read down here, it says, uh, Tales used geometry to calculate the heights of the pyramids and the distance of ships from the shore. So, of course, he had to be in Egypt to, to do that. So, it's telling you, he was in Egypt. He could do what he did because he learned this from the ancient Egyptians. But who were the Ionians? The Ionians, is we're going to talk about them a lot because they play a major role in this whole thing. Who were the Ionians? Now, when we look up the Ionians, it says the Ionians were one of the four major tribes that the Greeks considered themselves divided into during the ancient period. Alongside Dorians, Aeolians, and Achaeans, the Ionian dialect was one of the three major linguistic divisions of the Hellenic world, together with the Dorian and Aeolian dialects. Now, if you read Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James, he talks about Ionia. He talks about how philosophy was stolen from the ancient Egyptians by the Greeks and passed off as Greek philosophy. Now, on page 12, he says, the Ionians and Italians made no attempt to claim the authorship of philosophy because they were well aware that the Egyptians were the true authors. He goes on to say, for this reason, the so-called Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy, which first spread to Ionia, thence to Italy, and thence to Athens. And it must be remembered that at this remote period of Greek history, i.e. Tales to Aristotle, 640 BC to 322 BC, the Ionians were not Greek citizens, but at first, this is the, this is the big part, at first, Egyptian subjects and later Persian subjects. Now, when we look at the map, we can see where Ionia is. We know it's modern day Turkey, but at this time he's talking about, it was not yet part of the whole Greek territory. It later became part of Greece, and I'm gonna get into that later. But the key part is, how did the Ionians become Egyptian subjects? He didn't say Egyptian citizens, he said Egyptian subjects. So how did they become Egyptian subjects? So according to Herodotus, and I'm going to paraphrase this story because there's a lot more to it and to save time, I'm just going to paraphrase. But according to Herodotus, Samtek I was stripped of his power and chased into the marshes by 11 kings that ruled inside of Egypt. Now, the reason why they did this is because they believed that Samtek I was going to become powerful enough to strip them of their power and he was going to eventually rule all of Egypt by itself. So they chased him out of there. Now he ended up getting mercenaries. He ended up getting help from mercenaries from the Ionians and from the Carians. Now they helped him get rid of these kings and he basically ruled all of Egypt. Now they thanked them for helping him out. He gave the mercenaries land along the Pelusian arm of the Nile and they settled there and it was there for a long time. Now Amos the second. When he came into power, he moved the Ionians to Nacritus, Egypt. Now, he gave that city a lot of privileges. They had a free port there. They basically had a monopoly on international trade. He gave them land to build temples. They had their own assembly and their own administration. Now, the Ionians, along with the Dorians and the Aeolians, they built Hellenion, or Hellenion which is basically a Greek sanctuary in Nacritus, Egypt. So, understand. Understand what I'm saying? The Greeks had a sanctuary in Egypt. This is something that they are not talking about. But the Greeks and the Carians also had a marketplace there. They had a marketplace in Bubasis and in Sais and in Memphis, Egypt, and lower Bubasis. So they were trading there. They had a marketplace. This is something that is not talked about about Egypt. They're not telling you about what really was going on there. Now, the Greeks that was in Egypt also sent silver to Greece to help with the reconstruction of the Temple of Delphi. Now, this is like history that is not being talked about. And it's crazy when I go and I start reading the Bible, when I start reading a lot of, of uh, things that have to do with religion. This part of Egypt is not talked about. This history is not talked about because it destroys the validity of the Bible. And then we're going to get in and I'm going to show you this whole free port that I'm talking about. We're going to show you because this stuff has been proven. Herodotus wrote about this stuff and we found it. So as I said, the writings of Herodotus have been proven true time and time again. Now, a French archaeologist by the name of Frank Gaudio Using the writings of Herodotus found a sunken city in the Nile Delta. 
Now, this sunken city was called Heraklion by the Greeks and called Tanis by the ancient Egyptians. Now, and when they went to this, when they found this sunken city, I mean, it had a free port there. It had ships and they found boats. They've been pulling up statues and pulling up things for a long time from this place. But it just validates everything Herodotus is talking about when he's talking about these free ports and when he's talking about what they had at Nacritus. So it shows you that the Greeks was engaged in trade with the Egyptians. And everybody knew about it, but nobody's talking about it because it destroys the validity of the Bible. It paints the ancient Egyptians in a whole different light when you start finding these things. Now, and I've been trying to get people to read the book Hebrew is Greek for years by Joseph Yehuda. Now, the book is $1,800, I understand that, but you can get a PDF. It's a little bit thinner, lighter. It's not as good as the actual book, but you can read it. Now, it's a reason why this book costs $1,800. They don't want you to understand that the Hebrew language comes from Greek. And he proves 100% in this book that the Hebrew language comes from Greek. Now, there's a couple things and a couple points he wanted to make in this book. I want to read to you a few of them. Now, he says that Judean and Ashtadite were not more different one from the other than Hebrew is from Arabic or Aramaic. That the Jewish the Christo-European and the Islamic cultures, the triple aspect of modern civilization all originate from Hellas. That the Hebrews worship Greek gods and follow Greek customs. That Hebrew has a multiplicity of unsuspected dialects and homonyms. That many proper nouns in the Bible, whether divine, ethnic, geographical, or personal resemble Greek proper nouns, while others have Greek adjectives and common nouns or homologues. That judging by the proportion of epic and poetic homologues and by the primitive grammatical structures to be found in the Bible, one is impelled to the conclusion that the ancestors of the Jews must have been among the noblest and or the most ancient of Hellens and that they spoke a language far more ancient than classical Greek that when the Hellenic affinity of the Phoenicians had long been forgotten, it was assumed that the identity of the Greek with the Phoenician alphabet was simply a matter of borrowing. Herodotus 558 he cites. So let's go to Herodotus 558 and look what Herodotus is saying. Herodotus, Herodotus says, these Phoenicians who came with Cadmus and whom the Jephirians were apart brought with them to Hellas among many other kinds of learning, the alphabet, which had been unknown before this, I think, to the Greeks, as time went on, the sound and the form of the letters were changed. At this time, the Greeks who were settled around them were, for the most part, Ionians. And after being taught the letters of the Phoenicians, they used them with a few changes of form. In doing so, they gave to these characters the name of Phoenicians, as well quite fair, seeing that the Phoenicians had brought them into Greece. The Ionians have also formed from ancient times called sheets of papyrus skins, since they formerly used the skins of sheep and goats due to lack of papyrus. Even to this day, there are many foreigners who write on such skins. So now you have Herodotus sitting there talking about the Greek alphabet. He goes back to the Phoenicians. Now, does anybody pick up on the problem here? What are we missing? If you are talking about a sort of etymology of an alphabet and you go back to the Phoenicians, how can he go to the Phoenicians? This is the key part. Herodotus never mentions the Hebrews. So if you're talking about where this language could have came from, how come Herodotus, he talks about the Phoenicians, he, talk about, he talks about the Ionians, but he doesn't talk about the Hebrews who we are told by the Israelites and by everybody else who believes in his Bible that the Hebrew language is the first language, that it all starts with Hebrew. So why is he not talking about Hebrew? Why does Herodotus never mention the Hebrew? He doesn't talk about them because one, he died before the Greeks invaded Egypt, and there was no such thing as a Hebrew at that time. And again, I know people are going to say, well, Greek mythology is not older than the Hebrews. I'm going to prove that. We're going to go through all that because 
You have to understand what's history and what's the Bible. The Bible is not proven history. So just because the Bible says so, doesn't make it true. But we're going to go through that later. Okay, so understand what Joseph Yehuda is saying is when he starts studying this Greek language, when he starts tracing the etymology back and going way back to the dialect and to the alphabet, that it fits with ancient Phoenician. So then he goes and cites Herodotus, and Herodotus is backing it up, saying, yeah, the Phoenicians brought this whole alphabet. Now, understand, he said alphabet. He didn't say language. So they had to be speaking something before this alphabet because they obviously was, you know, conversing with the, with the Egyptians. So they obviously spoke uh, Egyptian or some kind of language. So they was obviously able to communicate with the Egyptians. So he's saying that the Phoenicians bring in this alphabet and teach them this alphabet. The Ionians had this alphabet, but they edited it. They changed it around a little bit to fit their dialect and they played with it and it came up with something different, which we know today is Greek. We call it Greek, but when you trace it back, it goes back to Phoenician. So he goes off of this and he does the same thing with Hebrew and he can trace it back. I mean, he does it very well in the book. He traces it back and it goes all the way back. You can see as he was saying about how homologs and certain things has just changed slightly to where you can tell this is the Greek language. He did all the homework, it's done. And other people as well follow his work. He actually already proved 90% of the letters in the alphabet goes back to Hebrew. He died before he could finish the other 10%, but other scholars picked up where he left off and proved the other 10%, proving 100% of the alphabet goes back to Greek. But if you don't do any research, you wouldn't know this. Herodotus backs it up. Everything backs it up. And it goes back to the Ionians again. So again, let's look at this. Who are these Ionians? And when we go in to read again, it says the Ionians were one of the four major tribes that the Greeks considered themselves divided into. I know I read it already. I'm going to read it again. During the ancient period, alongside the Dorians, the Aeolians, and the Achaeans, the Ionian dialect was one of the three major linguistic divisions of the Hellenic world together with the Dorian's Aeolian dialects. Remember, that's why he had to say the Aeolian dialects. It was a dialect. He's gone into the language. But when we scroll down, this, it, this is where it gets good because everybody's waiting for the whole where the Bible come into play part. When we scroll down, look at what it say. Biblical. In the book of Genesis, of the English Bible, Javan, is son of Japheth. Javan is believed nearly universally by Bible scholars to represent the Ionians. That is, Javan is Ion. So who is this Ion? Let's take a look. It says, according to Greek mythology, Ion was the illegitimate child of Creusia, daughter of Arethius and wife of Zeuthus. Creusia conceived Ion with Apollo, then she abandoned the child. But let's scroll down here where I have highlighted. It says, Ion was also believed to have founded a primary tribe of Greece, the Ionians. He has often been identified with the Javan mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Let's look some more about this Ion. Greek myth index. I got it highlighted down here, the part I wanted to show you. It says, however, her object was discovered for as Ion, before drinking, poured out a, li a libation to the gods, a pigeon which drank of it died on the spot. Creusia thereupon fled to the altar of the god. Ion dragged her away and was on the point of killing her when a priestess interfered, explained the mystery, and showed that Ion was the son of Creusia. Mother and son thus became reconciled, but Zeuthus was not let into the secret. The latter, however, was satisfied, for he too received a promise that he should become a father of, it says vis-a-vis, -vis, which basically means we're talking about Dorius and Achaeus. But who is Dorus and Achaeus? We're talking about the Dorians and the Achaeans, which is part of the four tribes of the Greeks, which makes up the Ionians, the Achaeans, the Aeolians, and the Dorians. So, it says down here, it says, after the death of Selenus, Ion succeeded the throne, and thus the Aegeleans received the name of Ionians. 
Ionians, and the town of Hellas was built in honor of Ion's wife. So here we go. We attaching Greek mythology to the Bible, but it's going to get deeper than this. It's going to go much deeper because I know a lot of people were saying, how is this older than Hebrew? And you got to remember that you're talking about a book. The Bible, it's a book. It's not proven history. We're not finding any ancient writings from the Hebrews that's predating Herodotus. We're not finding anything. If the, if the Hebrews did everything that the Bible spoke of, there is no way they would not have been mentioned by Herodotus and other scholars. I'm talking about before the time. I'm talking about during a Homeretic period, but we're going to get into all that. Okay, let's continue. It says, Additionally, but less surely, Japheth may be related linguistically to the Greek mythological figure Ipethus. Now it says Ipethus, also Japhethus, was a titan. Now, you scroll down, it says Ipethus and Japheth. Ipethus has been equated with Japheth, the son of Noah, based on the similarities of their names and on old Jewish traditions that held Japheth as the ancestor of the Greeks, the Slavs, the Italics, the Teutons, and the Javadians. See Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews. So when we look at Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, I'm just going to give you this little reference it says down here, Javan, Ionians, Greek. That's the only thing we need to see. Now, I have shown you before in my last video about how much Greek mythology parallels the Old Testament. And you can go look at even an apple and look at Pandora's box. We can look at the whole Noah's Ark story and look at Deucalion and Pharaoh. You got Hercules, you got Samson. So it's a lot of other things. We can just look at the Old Testament. You can look at uh, God and Zeus or God and Kronos or Satan and Kronos. It's a lot of things we can compare Greek mythology with the Old Testament. Now, first thing you got to ask yourself is if the Greeks stole that from the Hebrews, then you would have to prove that they knew of the Hebrews before the time of Homer. You would have to prove that Homer could read Hebrew and that he knew about the Hebrews. You will not be able to do that. You will also have to prove that Greek mythology was not worshipped by the Greeks before the Greeks invaded uh, Egypt. You can't do that. We, we're going to go by proof in this video. I'm going to go by proof and what the proof tells us and what the facts tells us. Now, you can stick your head in the Bible and believe everything is in there and you're going to be stuck just like these Hebrews is, but that's exactly what they're doing. You would sit there and believe, of course, Hebrew is older than Greek mythology, but it's not, and the, and the proof shows that it's not. So when we get into Greek mythology, how far back does it go? No one really knows, but we know it goes back at least to 1000 BCE because we can date the Lilad by Homer between the 11th century and the 8th century. We know that uh, Herodotus speaks of Homer, so we know that Homer was something that was talked about and he exists. Now, a lot of scholars, you know, debate about Homer and they think that the stories that he wrote about was just folklore. He was just the first one to put it into writing. But people talk about Homer. Herodotus speaks of him. But not just that. We can go to the British Museum. We can find artifacts from Greek mythology that dates between 480 and 400 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Zeus, which dates between 472 and 456 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Poseidon, 440 BCE. We can look at the Temple of Delphi, which is older. That goes from 548 BCE, where they held the Pantheon Games. This is where we get the Olympics. Now, you cannot find me an equivalent from Hebrew. Find me any Hebrew structures that's older than these. These are still around. The ruins are there. They existed. You will not find me any Hebrew structures or anything that existed, that is older than what we see here in Greece. So we can't say that the Hebrews came before Greek mythology or the Old Testament came before Greek mythology because there is no proof. You can't back it up. You're going from a Bible. It's just a book. There is no proof. No proof to back it up whatsoever. So now, this is supposed to be the oldest example of Hebrew writing they found in Israel. Now, when you go to the National Geographic website where it talks about this piece of pottery that they found. Now, notice, this is the picture that you mostly see when you try to research this situation. They don't really give you a good look at the actual piece of pottery. Not a really, really, you know, good look. But when you go to the website, it says here, oldest Hebrew text is evidence 
for Bible stories, question mark. Now, the actual article goes on to say the uh, exact nature of the text believed to be Hebrew written in proto-Canaanite script. That's not Hebrew. A type of early alphabet has yet to be determined, but a number of words have already been translated, including judge, slave, and king. But the archaeologist's claims are disputed by an Israeli colleague who says there is not enough scientific information to reach a definitive conclusion. So here comes this Israeli a Jew who's saying, no, this is not uh, Hebrew. We can't go ahead and just say it's Hebrew. There's not enough information to make a definitive claim. So you got a lot of people who was looking at this situation and just saying, no, it's not Hebrew. It's not Hebrew. Now, they will lead you to believe. They always tell you it is believed to be. They will lead you to believe that it is Hebrew writing, but it's not. So why not just be honest and say this is not Hebrew? We should know definitively that it is. They have to make this connection and somehow put Hebrew in ancient Israel when that's not the case. We know the Egyptians was there. But when you go to the next page, it goes on to say, Tel Aviv University archaeologist Israel Finkelstein, who was not involved in the Elah excavations, agreed the site is very important, but has significant concerns with Garfinkel's interpretation of the findings. Immediately drawing ties between the site and the kingdom of Judah is a mistake, he said, and it might as well have been Philistine in origin. Also, due to the small number of samples, the carbon-14 dating of the site is also not as precise as it should be, he added. We need to wait for more samples. It's not enough to date the site based on two olive pits, he said, because that's what they use to, to carbon-14 date a piece of pottery. So how are you going to use olive pits when, you, when we're talking about Hebrew writing? Well, that's how they do. Now, he goes on to say he also expresses doubts about the counterpiece of Garfinkel's finding the text. I am prepared to predict that it will be very difficult to determine whether the text is, in fact, Hebrew. There will be evidence indicating various possibilities, he said. And the nature of its discovery, this piece of pottery, is also not unusual. There is a group of late proto-Canaanite pottery shards from the same chronological phase that have been found in various sites on the coastal plains. None of them was discovered in Judea proper. So here comes this other uh, archaeologist who's saying that they jumping the gun on this, and it's not Hebrew. So when we go back and we try to start finding ancient Hebrew writings, you're going to always only find a piece of pottery or a shard or something on like a wooden bar, something that a little a four year old could carve into a board. Now, if you get a piece of pottery, if you get something that's old, you can carve whatever you want into it and say it's Hebrew. You need to find stuff like we found with the Greeks. You need to find civilizations. You need to find like whole documentation. It's so unbelievable to me that these people are supposed to have existed for so long. They're supposed to have existed for so long and done so much, yet there is so little about them. The ancient Egyptians are so old. Look how much we have on them. Look how much we have on the Greeks. We got a lot of information. We have structures. We have bodies. We have everything. But you can't find nothing when it comes to these ancient Hebrews who's supposed to be ancient. Their writing is supposed to be older than the Phoenicians, it's supposed to be the first writing. But yet, they keep trying to mix in the Hebrew language with the Phoenician, when it should be the other way around. But you can't find any Hebrew. Now, they want to sit there and tell us that, well, God destroyed Jerusalem, or he destroyed Israel like 20 times in the Bible, when a lot of the information got lost. But what if he did that, why do we have so much of Egyptian uh, artifacts that we found in uh, Israel? Why do we have so much proof? of Egyptians being in Israel, but not actual Hebrews.